When you view it from afar, the city is silent, a cluster of towering spires against the sky. But as you move down, across rooftops, over rivers, past factories and rail yards into the center, the city comes alive, jostling, turbulent, bellowing in a thousand voices. Taxi! Taxi! Mark it down, ten dollars. My friends of this great city! Why the lady flowers? Why the lady flowers? Signals, crosswalks, the Sherry Carlton Towers, the glass and concrete canyons, rooms with bath or showers. Hurry, hurry, do I hear 550? The Philharmonic Concert, the Blue Place, me too. The traffic cops, the billboards, the milkman out at dawn, the lights along the freeway coming on and on and on. CBS presents The City, an impression for radio, a cross-section of the thousands of stories of daily living that make The City. And now, with Frank Goss as your narrator, here is tonight's tale of The City, a story called Airport. The city is a place of arrivals and departures. On the outside, fixed and permanent. But beneath the flat roofs and tall towers, changing hourly, a flexible sum with continuous additions and subtractions. Minus 230. The sleek streamliner leaving the train sheds in the shimmering light of afternoon. Diners filled to overflowing in a bridge game already begun in the club car. Subtracts a fraction from the city. Plus five. A hopeful jalopy turns into the deep, bright thoroughfares of the city. The dust of the Middle West still thick on the mudguard. A mattress strapped from beneath the precarious cover of a propped-up turtleback. Three wide-eyed children are added to the sum total that is the city. Plus 423. The great liner, newly repainted with patriotic smokestacks, docks in a tugboat cluster. Proud conveyance in a proud harbor. Smiling at the customs officials, flirting and whistling. Minus one. Hey, hey, mister, how about a ride? Going north? Hey, hey, hey. The raised thumb loses its jaunty expectancy as the long yellow shafts of light disappear down the highway, swallowed by the hungry night. By wheels and gasoline, by the gangplank to A-deck and the hobo road, by lumbering buses, broad-chested trains and soaring wings, the sum of the city has changed, retotaled hourly with the final tabulation... Always in doubt. The city is a place of arrivals and departure. The constellation from Buenos Aires, Lima, Panama City, Mexico City, and El Paso arriving at gate three. Passengers may now board the non-stop flight to New York, leaving from gate six. At the city airport, the, the airline arrivals airline are a matter of timetables, bulletin boards, and weather reports. But in an uncomfortable furnished room hung above a busy intersection, they are cause for uneasy concern. Well, goodbye, Les. i got to be shoving off. And you'd better to make tracks out to the airport. You don't want to be late. Not tonight. No, i got plenty of time. She's not due till 11. You know, when I knew you in college, you're the last guy in the world I'd have picked to marry a French gal. But, heck, the war makes a lot of difference. If I hadn't been in the South Pacific, I'd probably have done the same thing. Maybe. I sure don't blame you. I've heard a lot about France. No. When we were in the islands, we really envied you guys. <laughs> a small cafe, mamzelle. How round Oh, shut up, shut up, Cliff. What? Hey, what's the matter? I'm just kidding. Well, I don't think it's very funny. Look, Les, take it easy. I don't blame you for being nervous. I would be too if I were in your boots. With a, a wife I hadn't seen for two years and a kid I'd never laid eyes on flying in tonight. But it'll work out. Things always do. Well... So long, fella. Take it easy. The freckled young man runs his fingers through his stiff, crew-cut hair, slumps against the Mohair Davenport, thinking, remembering. (laughs) 
After a moment, he stands up suddenly and stuffs his hands in the pockets of his faded field jacket. As he moves toward the door, the uncertain light from the dusty chandelier cuts across his sleeve, revealing a dark olive stain where Staff Sergeant Stripes once indicated their authority. Along the banks of the river that partitions the city, the air is filled with the acrid smell that factories belch after meals of coal and oil. This is the domain of the assembly line, the Bessemer converter, the graph, the ledger, and the sales curve. Here, human beings are balanced with the books. Come in. Uh, Mr. Ryder. Yes, Beckman, sit down. Uh, What's the trouble? Company run out of red ink again? Uh, no, sir. Uh, that is, well, I... What is it, then? Mr. Ryder, I... I've been the head bookkeeper for Ryder and Lewis for uh, uh, 20 years. You're 22, I... Beckman, 22. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I... Look, Beckman, uh, no one knows you deserve a raise more than I do, but uh, business conditions haven't been so promising lately, and, well, frankly, we just can't afford it. Oh, no, sir. It, it isn't a raise. Well, it can be very serious. I, I'm afraid it is rather serious. You see, Mr. Ryder, I... I've robbed you of $10,000. What? <laughs> That's right. I, I've stolen $10,000 from the company's funds. And to be exact... Uh, in just a moment, I have the figures right here... It's $10,346. Uh, yes, that's the total to date. Oh, I just don't believe it. Well, I I hadn't realized myself that the sum was quite so large. I I checked the amount when I was readying the books for the auditor this afternoon. The stock market hasn't been so good this year, Mr. Ryder. In fact, not good at all. Do I understand you correctly, Beckman? You've been playing the stock market with company funds? Oh, yes, sir. I've been doing it for years. Oh, only usually I, I've broken about even. I, in fact, one year I made a considerable profit. I split it with the company, Mr. Ryder. Really, I did. Share and share alike. Blackman, I, well, I just don't know. Well, I, I wouldn't have bothered about it, sir, but you see the sum is so sizable, and with the auditor coming tomorrow, it wouldn't look well for my bookkeeping. All that money unaccounted for, so perhaps you'll want to call the police. Do you realize that this is a serious matter, that if I call in the police, you're likely to go to the penitentiary? Oh, yes, Mr. Ryder. I, I'm quite aware of that. And that's why I thought that in view of my 20 years with the company... 22. You, uh, 22, that perhaps you'd be able to give me a little time. I, I'm sure I can replace the funds. I, I've already wired my brother in Denver. He, he's quite well to do, and I'm positive he, he'll advance me the sum, but... I'll have to have a little time. Perhaps you could just explain to the auditor that you'd lent me the money. Beckman, I don't want to send you to prison any more than you want to go there, but that money isn't mine to lend or give away. It belongs to our stockholders. If if I lied about this matter, I'd be as guilty as you are. Can't you understand that? Yes, sir. I guess you're right. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Ryder. Thanks very much. Well, wait a minute, Beckman. You said your brother would give you the money. How do you know that? Oh, I, I, I wired from I have a wire from him, you see. Oh. Here. Here it is. You read it, Mr. Ryder. Tempting. Raise money. Denver. Possible. Will arrive. Flight 17, 11 p.m. tonight. Meet at airport. Can't promise, but we'll try. Love, Fred. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to raise the money, sir. Fred's very influential in Denver. Very influential. Well, Beckman, in view of your long service, I suppose I could let you have till midnight to replace the money. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ryder. I, I can't That'll tell you That'll give how... you an hour to get in from the airport. But remember, midnight, or I shall be forced to call the police. Well, that's all for tonight, Miss Thompson. I have to hurry to the airport. I don't want to miss Meyerberg. Oh, uh, what flight did his wire say? 17 at 11 p.m. I checked it. It's expected on time. Ah, <laughs> good girl. I wonder if the old boy's changed much. You studied under Dr. Marburg, didn't you, Professor? Worship that his feet would be closer to the truth. His books were my Bible. Meyerberg's the authority in the field. Oh. And now he's going to teach here at the university. He'll be under me. Yeah, there's irony for you. He's never been to America before, has he? No, no, never. I wonder why. Well, the uh, fact is he was coming once just after the war began. But there was a woman, an American who lived abroad. Uh-oh. They'd known each other for years. 
She was desperately pulling strings to get back to the States, and her clearance came through before Marburg's. I see. I don't know exactly what happened after that. She took his passage or talked him out of it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she got back, and he was left in Europe. Oh, how terribly unfair. Well, I mean, he could have been so useful to this country. Yes, I know. The woman? Oh, I haven't any idea. I suppose she's around somewhere. I wonder if they'll meet someday. I hope not. I sincerely hope not. She nearly ruined his life once. I wouldn't like to think that she'd get another chance. Darling, it was so wonderful of you to call. I can't tell you how much it means to me. Well, I couldn't let you get away without a word. What time did your plane leave? Midnight. Isn't that a ghastly hour to start <laughs> off? It's the only thing I could get, and I have to catch the Queen Mary day after tomorrow. Heaven knows when there'll be another boat. Oh, my dear, how I envy you. I'd give anything in the world to be going along. Oh, darling, I just have to get back to Paris. America was all right during the war, but now that the frightful mess is finished, I can't tell you how glad I am to get away. <laughs> of course, I was born here, but Paris is my true home. The only place for a cultured person to live. And, uh, Kurt, you'll be seeing him again, won't you? Well, I really have no idea. I believe he's married or something, some foreign girl. Anyway, that's all past and forgotten. No, I don't expect to see Kurt. Flight from Honolulu, now unloading at gate four. Passengers will claim their baggage at the... The arriving center. rush up the fenced walk and into the vaulted milling room. Their faces are eager and intent. They carry briefcases, pocketbooks, and unread magazines. They clasp loved ones, hail taxis, and check reservations, all in a frenzied race against time. All aboard, please. The departing sling hand baggage in the counter scales, down last-minute cups of coffee speak adoring, tender words, running their hands through soft, soon-to-be-forgotten hair, buy magazines that will remain unread, or obtain a last-minute teddy bear, a promise nearly neglected amid the convention excitement. Only the waiting moves slowly, dawdling over flat cocktails in the airport restaurant, carefully studying the sudden jerk of the minute hand on the official clock, or wandering aimlessly along the ticket counter, asking foolish, repetitious questions. Miss, uh, oh, miss. Yes, sir? You're sure the only flight 17 is the one that comes in at 11 o'clock? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you. You see, my wife and son are coming in on the plane, and I haven't seen them for a long time. <laughs> well, in fact, I've never seen my son, and I wouldn't want to miss them. You understand. Of course. They'll be here soon. You're meeting the right plane. There's nothing to worry about. No. Not a thing to worry about, except that I don't know if I want to meet the plane or not. I don't know if there's any hope for a marriage that hasn't really begun. I don't even know if I want Yvonne anymore, if I can learn to love a kid I've never seen. No, I haven't got a thing to worry about. Not a thing. The young man pulls the faded field jacket tight across his broad chest. He seats himself on a hard bench. His close-cropped head falls back wearily, almost touching the thin gray hair of the man behind him. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bump you. Uh, what? Oh, that's all right. Uh, quite all right. A pair of pale blue eyes behind steel-rimmed spectacles flash toward the ex-sergeant and then flick upward at the clock as the hands touch eleven. It's time now. Just a few minutes and the whole mess will be over. Fred will bring the money. He's never let me down before. Now I'll take it to Mr. Ryder. He won't file charges. Give me another chance. But what if Fred doesn't come? What if he didn't get the money? I can't go to prison. I'm not strong enough. I couldn't face the disgrace. No, I'd have to take another way out. Shorter way. If, if I had the nerve to use a gun. Attention, please. Flight 17 has been unavoidably delayed. Flight 17 from New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Kansas City, and Denver will not arrive on schedule. The little man with the steel-rimmed glasses walks quickly over to the counter with nervous steps. Uh, Miss. Oh, Miss. Yes, sir? Uh, uh, That plane. uh, The one that's late. Uh, Could you tell me if there was a Mr. Beckman arriving on it? 
Uh, uh, Mr. Fred Beckman. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We don't have passenger lists available for incoming flights. Oh, I see. Well, uh, 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 how late will it be? Flight 17? We aren't quite sure. There was illness aboard, and they had to make a special stop in Wichita. I imagine it'll be in about 12.30. 12.30? Well, perhaps a little sooner, but certainly not until after midnight. After midnight? Uh, and there's no point in my waiting. Thank you. The little man stands still for a moment, stunned, his glasses askew, his head drooping on his frail shoulders, his teeth biting into his lower lip. Slowly, walking as in a nightmare, he moves on to the field, creeps past the bright-lit hangars, where tired mechanics feed oil and extra bolts to the hungry fledglings, soon to try their fabric wings. The backwash from a propeller blows the man's glasses onto the ground. He stoops to pick them up and then chuckles. <laughs> Silly. I don't imagine I'll need these. I don't expect to do any bookkeeping. He stops, listening to the night around him. Then he makes a decision. He walks briskly to the public telephone booth, standing like a mute sentinel at the gateway to the field. In the terminal building, the activities of the night continue unaltered. At a writing table in the corner, two white turban Hindus play a serious game of chess. A well-dressed girl lies stretched out on one of the benches, her head cushioned on a folded mink coat. She has fallen asleep and snores with a quiet, polite regularity. The stoop-shouldered professor is immersed in a volume of Earl Stanley Gardner and does not look up as a red-haired woman flounces past him, waving an angry cigarette holder. Young woman, am I to understand that your company refuses to carry my luggage? I'm very sorry, madam. The rules allow only 40 pounds to each passenger. We cannot transport wardrobe trunks aboard an airline. Oh, I must insist on having my trunks with me. They contain cosmetics and tin food, things I'll need in Paris. Oh, I'm very sorry. You'll have to ship them by express. We simply don't have the baggage space aboard your plane. Oh, I've never heard of such cheek. I'll report this matter to the head of the airline personally. Such impudent employees would never be tolerated in Europe. Never. It's one of the troubles with America. Atrocious service. I'm very sorry, madam. <laughs> The minute hand of the official clock moves jerkily onward and in a single motion creates a new yesterday and a new tomorrow. The young man with a crew haircut fingers the lapel of his field jacket and in the bright electric light, shadows grow visibly under his weary eyes. It's after midnight. The plane should be in now. In one instant, I'll become a husband and a father. But I don't want that. I want to go on like I was. Alone. I... I don't want Yvonne and, and my son. I don't want to meet the plane. Flight 17 from New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Kansas City, and Denver is now arriving at gate 5. Flight 17 is now arriving. Well, they're here. And now I've got a family. The ex-staff sergeant pulls himself to attention and strides toward gate 5. Flight 17 lies poised at the gateway to the city, serene, silver, and beautiful. Her four great engines coughing just a little behind their fans as they slowly relax their violent embrace on the night air. Harried, white-coated attendants push the landing ladder into place, the old door swings back, and the process of adi adding to the city is completed as the smiling stewardess assists the passengers downward to their separate city destinies. The couple seem out of place amid the hurrying travelers. Elderly, ill-dressed, gawking with amazement at the distant towers of the city, like wide-eyed children loose in a department store during Christmas time. Well, Martha, it's been a long trip. It has been a wonderful trip, Kurt. There is so much of the world to see. Are you frightened, Martha? <laughs> of course. Oh, my little... Such a big country with such big cities and the big people. Now, Kurt, you are as big a man as any of them. Bigger. Not bigger, but perhaps here in America, just as big. The red-haired woman, Paris Bound, with her cigarette holder tracing gray, gesturing spirals against the search-lit night, hesitates, frowns, and then moves forward eagerly. Oh, how 
wonderful to see you. Well, when did you get to America? Why didn't you wire? We must go somewhere and talk. Look, uh, oh, hurry, look. darling. I only have a few minutes. And unless I put off my trip, I suppose I could. I'm you... very sorry, madam. Uh, what? I'm afraid you've mistaken me for someone else, a different person. But, but I don't understand. I think you must have the wrong man. Oh, I see. Of course. Sorry to have bothered you. I'm very sorry. Well, that's the trouble with this country. Too many foreigners. It's even more unbearable than ever. Who was she, Kurt? Do you know her? No, my dear. I don't know her. Dr. Marburg. Dr. Oh. Marburg. Dr. Marburg. Oh. Do you remember me? Of course. Your Maxville, Vienna, 1935. <laughs> 1936. Really? I thought it was 35. <laughs> oh, this is my wife, Professor Maxwell. How do you How do? do? You do? I want to welcome you both to the university. Our city is proud to have you here. America is proud to have you. <laughs> The ex-sergeant watches grimly as the passengers walk through gate five. Pardon me, are you Mr. Johnson, uh, Yvonne's husband? Well, yes, I've, I've been waiting for her, but I, uh, I, I didn't see her get off the plane. No, I was a stewardess on Flight 17. Your son was taken ill, and we put down in Wichita so he could have medical attention. That's why the plane was delayed. The boy's sick? Oh, now, please don't be alarmed. It's nothing serious. They'll be along in a day or two. Now, don't you worry. Good night. Uh, oh, good night. Uh, and thanks. The young man hesitates, frowning uncertainly. His eyes are puzzled. He walks a few steps toward the main entrance. Then he turns and paces deliberately to the ticket counter. Yes? Could you tell me when I can get a plane for Wichita? I'd like to get there as soon as possible. Mr. Beckman, please call at the ticket counter. There's a telegram for him. Mr. Beckman, please. The voice on the loudspeaker is too weak and too distant to be heard by the little man standing in the telephone booth. His hand shakes violently as he dials a number. His forehead is damp with perspiration. He waits, trembling, trying to mouth the words he will say. Police station. Sergeant Bundy speaking. I... Uh, Bundy speaking. Sergeant Bundy. My name is George Beckman. George W. Beckman. Yeah, yeah. I'm... I'm an accountant for Ryder and Lewis. I... I've stolen some money from my employer. I wish to give myself up. What? I'm telephoning you from the airport. You can arrest me here. I... I'll be waiting for you in the telephone booth near the runway. Well, I'll be... Uh, okay, okay, you just wait there. I'll have a guy out there pick you up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Beckman? Mr. Beckman? Telegram for Mr. Beckman at the ticket counter, please. Well, there's no point in calling that any longer, Jim. The guy just isn't around. It doesn't seem like it. It's a money order, too. Oh, well, he can get it tomorrow. It'll do him just as much good then as it will now. CBS has brought you The City, an impression for radio, a cross-section of the thousands of stories and dramas that are enacted daily in The City. In tonight's impression of the city, an all-star cast of radio performers created the drama of Airport, including Norman MacDonald, Lenore Kingston, Gil Warren, Herb Butterfield, Earl Lee, Sandy Bickert, Rita Lynn, Monty Margots, and Anne Morrison. The city is directed by David Vale with tonight's story, Airport, by Robert Libet and Frank Burt. The music was conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and this is your narrator, Frank Goss, wishing you good evening.